Praise the Lord, church. You may be seated for a moment. I've been reminded by my wife I make people stand too long sometimes. She's, she's still trying to teach me some things. I might learn. I don't know. You know, when I'm preparing a message, I, um, I generally look at the number of pages, the page count, to give me an idea of, you know, is this, is this what usually we have to work with? And, and um, tonight, the, the number of pages I, I have is about half as many as I normally would have. That's because my printer printed it on both sides this time, so don't worry. It's, 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 uh, <laughs> you, we're not going to shortchange you tonight. I don't know about you. Um, do you consider yourself a person that views the world as a, a glass that's half empty or a glass that's half full, right? We, we, you've heard that term before. Um, I would consider myself leaning towards the optimistic side, and sometimes that gets me in trouble. Um, honey, I'll be home in 15 minutes, 45 minutes later. Right? In my head, it should only take that long, but in reality, it takes much, much longer, so my, my optimism sometimes is misplaced. Um, I will start to, to be concerned about the glass that's half full or half empty when I have just poured myself some tea for dinner, and I come back to the plate and find out half of it's gone, and I wonder who drank it, right? When all of a sudden something's missing. So I, we probably all at times perceive the glass half empty or half full, depending on some circumstances. You know, as individuals, we, we could all experience the exact same situation in a room and, and each of us perceive it differently. Because we have this lens of perception, we could hear the same things, we could experience the same things, but then when we compared notes, we, we could have different perceptions of what actually happened. Um, this is because we, we view the lens, or we view the world through our own lens of perception. And it's not that, that your perception is right or wrong, or my perception is right or wrong, they're just our perceptions. They're, they're always right for us from the sense of what we thought we saw and heard. You know, as individuals, there's, there's many factors that lend themselves to the um, perceptions that we have. Pastor mentioned it this morning, like we're, we're a body of believers of all different personalities, all different backgrounds, experiences, and while experiences contribute a portion of our perceptions, there's, there's science that supports evidence that says that some of our traits are, we're born with. That, that there's, there's things that God has programmed into you from the very beginning that were passed to you genetically. Your profile, elements of your personality. Um, a few years ago, we did a, a, a workshop, a communication workshop. Um, raise your hand if you were in that workshop around the, the personality and communication types. It was, a fun, it was a fun time learning about each other. Um, I'll give you the short version if you weren't there. there we found out that within the body, there's four um, primary profiles that people can fall into. That's not to say that that's their only profile, but um, while you can be a blend of different profiles, generally there's one that's going to stand out and be your kind of primary. And so through a series of questions, they help you uncover this. And we found out that uh, within the body of believers, there's people who were um, considered greens. And now again, there is no, there's no bad color. Green is generally considered a good color. So right away, right, we have biases. Green means go, red means stop. So if you're red, that must be bad. No, there is no bad or good. There's just different. Uh, greens were people who wanted to collect all the information about a subject up front. They, they, they wanted to know the information um, before they made a decision as an example of uh, what made them tick or unique about their profile. There were golds. Th those were people who wanted to, to get the job done right, very task-orientated, sometimes perfectionists. Um, blues were more interested in the interpersonal stuff, um, prioritizing people and feelings, maybe even over the task or an agenda. I w it was interesting to see that was the largest group within the groups, and, and thank God for it in a church where um, a church or a group of people would put people first as one of their, just their natural tendencies. 
uh, worried more about you than whatever else is going on. Uh, the last group was orange, and um, orange preferred less structure, highly creative. They were always looking for something new and exciting. And for them, a, a change in direction was easy to make. Like they could pivot and go in a different direction. Like the plan, what plan? Let's go this way. All different personalities, all different profiles. Um, some of those experiences or those, those personality profiles, they come from our genes, they come from our DNA. And while golds have a hard time admitting it, all profiles are okay. There isn't one that's better than the other. If you're a gold, you'll know what I'm talking about. God made us just the way we are because he wanted us to be just the way we are. And there's some things that um, different people within the body can do more easily because they have a, a different set of giftings through that DNA, even that profile, that may come easily to them that's very difficult for me. And there may be things that are come easy for me that would cause somebody else that would be more difficult for them. That's not to say that anyone can't uh, grow and mature and learn how to um, recognize when maybe their profile gets in the way of whatever is trying to happen, but like Pastor said it so perfectly, I can see where God has been moving and, and directing even tonight's message that he's put us all together for a reason because there's people that you can reach that I can't. And there's people that I can reach that you can't. And thank God for it. And so while the, the foundation of our personality and profiles may have been inherited from genes, um, there's, there's always all the other things we experience in life that add to that, um, to that, that lens of perception in which we then start to view the world. And there's things that we experience in life um, some good, some bad, and, and they can then cause a ripple effect as, as we, we retain that experience and carry it forward as we, we experience new things and we use our past experience to inform our decision making, sometimes good, sometimes bad. And so while our human nature and our past can sometimes jade our perception of the world, I thank God that his word can guide us and that his spirit can realign us there's some things that, that I don't, I couldn't change except God changed them in me, right? There, there's, there's some things that God can produce that I can't produce. I can't will myself there. And the same is true for all of us. And so tonight, God wants to make some adjustments in our own perception. If you'd stand with me, we're going to turn and really focus on just two chapters in Luke, chapters 9 and 10. We're going to start kind of with the end in mind, and then we're going to go backwards and build up to that. Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 17. Luke 10 and 17 says this, And the 70 returned again with joy. Notice it's not the 12. Normally we read about the 12, the 12 disciples know that we're not, we're not talking about the 12 anymore. We're talking about the 70. The 70 returned again with joy and saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. They used the name because they had the revelation of who Jesus was. Jesus, your, your authority, your name, it, 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 it does things. It, it has given us abilities that we didn't have before. Verse 18. And he, Jesus, said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Wait a minute, Jesus, you're, you're 30 years old. How, how did you see Satan cast out of heaven? Well, I'll tell you how, because Jesus is God, and it was Jesus who evicted Satan from his position as chief angel. Verse 19, Behold, I, Jesus, because I have the authority to give. I give unto you the power to tread on serpents and on scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, even the power of sin in our lives. And nothing shall by any means hurt you or, or damage you beyond repair or damage you beyond salvation. Notwithstanding, in this power that you have now experienced through the authority of my name, notwithstanding this, Rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but re rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. 
in verse 21, the, the focus and title of our message tonight, in that hour, Jesus rejoiced in his spirit and said, I thank thee, Father, O Lord, in heaven and earth. Thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. Jesus, God in the flesh, rejoiced when the nobodies suddenly recognized they were somebodies. Amen. In that moment, they, they had a, 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 a change in their perception, a, a revelation, an understanding that I used to not be able to do this, but now I have this, this, this authority, this gift, this, and they recognized it with excitement as they stepped into that role, exercising the power and the authority of the name. Would you pray with me tonight? Lord, I, I'm asking that you would align us with your word, that your spirit would direct us, God, that we would allow our perceptions to be changed tonight according to your will, according to your purpose, God, that you would work in our hearts and our minds, God, that t tomorrow when we look in the mirror, we would see a different reflection with a different understanding, a more perfect picture of who we are in you. We ask it in Jesus' name tonight. Amen. You may be seated. Um, to a degree, tonight we're, we're also uh, picking up from where we last spoke to you about um, how Jesus is that stone that the builders refused and now has become the chief cornerstone, the, the measure and the pattern from which this church, his church, is to be built. Um, and so... Again, we're going to just consider Luke chapter 9 and 10 as our text. And so we started at the end, and now we're going to go a little bit back to the beginning. And I just want to weave in here the, the notion that ties into that previous thought. And, and it wasn't a plan. It was just God saying, here, look, look how I'm putting all these things together. In the same Luke chapter 9, verse 22, Jesus refers back to that same prophecy of the rejected stone becoming the head of the corner. In Luke 9 and 22, it says, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be slain and be raised on the third day. He's the chief cornerstone. Um, it, was a, it was a delightful surprise to me as I, as I read the, through these two chapters, chapter 9 and chapter 10 of Luke, as, as God brought these thoughts into focus to see the, the orchestration of the Spirit as this text also crosses the message that we shared with you just prior to that last message about how some things cannot come except by prayer and fasting. If we consider again the, chapter 9 and 10 as our text, in 9 and 40, we can read the same account of the man who came to Jesus because his disciples could not cast out the devil, even though they had experienced that authority in casting out devils. Something different was in this case where when they tried to exercise the authority, there was, there was something that came short. That same text was the text we focused on that Jesus replied, except some things come by, not except by prayer and fasting, that there's a, a measure of our flesh that can get in the way even when we know how to exercise the authority. And so uh, just considering uh, these two chapters as our text tonight, God is weaving together a story, and, and so we're going to build on some of that. And even this morning, as Pastor preached and, and, and introduced the thought with um, how, or he preached to us about how important unity is and love among, among the brethren, that, that we're all equal parts of the body. God is no respecter of persons. And, and, and he spoke those words after I already wrote these notes. So we don't, we don't go home and quick, like, how do we make this sound more connected? <laughs> but the, and if by chance, I was sharing this with Pastor, if by chance um, the notes say the same thing he preached, I would have to say the same thing all over again because it's not my decision. It's, it's, it's God's decision to direct and so it's, but it's really exciting to me when, when God, he, he pulls back the curtain just, just enough for you to see how orchestrated things are going and that he, he is the one in charge and that he's the one deciding this or that. And then we don't always perceive that, but every once in a while, yeah. he gives us a, a sneak peek into to what's really going on. It's reassuring to know that the author and finisher of our, of our faith hasn't put the pen down. He, he doesn't stop writing. He's still writing today. The story of, that's our lives, and if he's still writing our story, well, then there's things that we haven't experienced yet that he intends us to experience. Church, don't let your past experiences limit your perception of what God has planned. 
He's called us to such a time as this. He's called us to this day and this hour. And we, through our alignment to that chief cornerstone, we, through the putting down of our flesh, as, as we step out from being nobodies to being somebodies, walking in spirit and truth, setting captives free, taking authority over every evil thing that wants to divide and destroy. And while we may not fully perceive ourselves in this role, God is going to add to our individual experiences to give us testimonies about his miraculous working power. And those experiences will lead us to take additional steps in faith into new dimensions in the spirit, emboldened by the demonstrations of God's power working in us and around us. You see, we're, we're, we're... we perceive the world based on our experiences and God wants to bring some new experiences into our perceptions so that we can perceive the world differently. The world with his name as being the highest authority. Because perception is a very powerful thing. Proverbs 23 and 7 says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you think you're a grasshopper, well, you'll perceive yourself and be a grasshopper. If you think your prayers don't matter, well, then your prayer will be far and few between. If you think you don't matter in the kingdom of God, well, you're wrong. You do matter. Your value to the kingdom of God is infinitely more than what you perceive it to be. Tonight here we we gather in a church service like this so that our hearts and our minds can become realigned with God's will and his purpose and his word so that we can fill our our minds with the songs of Zion, so that we can hear the word of God preached, spoken into our thoughts, so that as we think is, so we will be. Philippians 4 and 8 in the Bible says, think on these things, whatsoever is true, whatsoever is, is honest, things that are just, things that are pure, things that are lovely, and of a good report, think on these things. These patterns that show up because of our thoughts become the perceptions that, that then we perceive the world that we live in and how we react. And these patterns can become so strong and entrenched, they, they can become what's called unconscious bias. Um, it's difficult to identify an unconscious conscious bias, mainly because it's not something you choose consciously. It happens without your decision making, at least not your conscious decision making. Human resource departments often provide training to those managers who conduct interviews, hiring interviews, about a long list of unconscious biases. We won't go through them all, but um, one example is the beauty bias. Subconsciously, the beauty bias makes assumptions that attractive people are more successful, competent, and qualified, and, and therefore they often get the job offer. I saw a real life example of this bias tested with random people who volunteered to participate in a social science experiment. The participants would be um, presented with four people in like a lineup fashion. They wouldn't be able to talk to them or um, learn anything about them, except that the person conducting the experiment would would list off four vocations, four titles, four um, jobs that these people, the true jobs that someone in this list held. So four people, four true jobs. Um, assign the, the roles and titles to the people you think, you know, best guess. Obviously, it's a guessing game. But it wasn't about the, uh, testing could they guess the right answers. The, te- the, the test was who would they associate these titles with. And the people conducting the experiment were not surprised when um, those that were the most attractive got the most prestigious titles assigned to them because of this beauty bias. Now, you might ask yourself, well, where did this come from? How does this happen? Well, it comes from advertising. It comes from media. It comes from Hollywood. There's, there's a, a barrage of messaging that says this is what happy looks like. This is what success looks like. And, and so then when it walks in the door, it gets hired. Right. It's interesting. If you, if, you were to, if you were able to go back in time, um, let's say long before any kind of... Uh, that kind of entertainment existed. Let's say in, um, in the late 1800s, maybe mid 1800s, um, success looked like somebody who had a little extra weight on. Amen. <laughs> right, because that meant that you had resources, that you were well fed, that, that you weren't like everybody else who was just hoping to find their next meal and, and right? Those early settlers, 
If you look at pictures of them, there was, there, they were all skin and bones. Success looked like you had a little extra. Well, the world has just painted a different picture of what success looks like, and so now there's a bias in the world that we all live with that just says, oh, you're attractive, you must be smart, successful. Social media hasn't helped, right? The, this, this, this bias is perpetuated, and so, of course, the church isn't biased at all, right? Oh, liars. <laughs> the truth is, good and bad, we all come with some unconscious bias. If it were conscious bias, then we would have to have a Bible study about your wrong thinking and modes of operation. But unconsciously, it's hard to, it's hard to detect sometimes even. But the Spirit, of God's Spirit working in us can help us to overcome the things that would otherwise prevent us from becoming the people of God that God would love us to be, that wants us to be, to contribute to the kingdom of God in the way that he would want us to contribute. Turn again to Luke chapter 9 as our text for tonight. In verse 46, we can see unconscious bias running wild in his disciples. Luke chapter 9 and 46, then there arose a reasoning among them, which of them should be the greatest? Pastor, I think you preached this one this morning. And Jesus perceiving the thought in their heart, took a child and set them by him and said unto them, Whosoever shall receive this child in my name receiveth me, and whosoever shall receiveth me receiveth him that sent me, and for he that is least among you, the least among you all shall be the, the greatest. The same shall be great. So here's the principle that we need to understand that, that we have to undo that the world has taught us. It, it's hard to apply because we're biased to think the greatest is the greatest. Right? The, 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 the person with the title is the greatest. The person in charge is the greatest. The greatest is the greatest. It's obvious. Wrong. It's a bias. It's a pattern that we've, we've, we've without our choice, just by the sake of living, now have in our, our thought process. And God is saying, no, no, I need, to, I need to undo some things. I need you to stop thinking of yourself as not great. In the kingdom of God, it's, it's not the way that it works that the greatest is the greatest. The least is the greatest. Our human nature can't help but believe what it wants to believe because of the world that we live in. But if we buy into this, this bias that the greatest is the greatest, it, it can cause an individual to pull back and step away from the will of God in their life because they perceive them not to be great themselves. They are thinking, I, I'm not important, so therefore I can't. But tonight, the scriptures are helping to realign our thinking and remembering that if we'll humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, it, God will exalt us. Tonight, as we, as we go through Luke chapter 9 and Luke chapter 10, we're trying to ask the question, what was it that made God rejoice? What, what put a smile on the face of Jesus that that, that came from that, like, well, that's good stuff right there. Turn to your neighbor right now and say, what was it? What was it? What was it that, that put a smile on the face of Jesus? He rejoiced in the hour when his children suddenly recognized who they were. When they, when they stepped into the power and authority that was in his name, when their perception moved from wherever it was to wherever God wanted it to be, something greater than they ever imagined. Jesus rejoiced when his children's first thought wasn't, I've got to call the pastor. No, no, they realized, I have access to God. I have the ability to pray. I, I, not that you shouldn't or can't, but his prayers aren't more effective than your prayers or my prayers, and we can pray one for another as we should. But we're not trying to find the greatest to pray because we all have equal access. When we recognize that 
who we are and step into that role when our perception changes that we need somebody better than us to pray, that we are actually capable to, to speak yeah. these things, that puts a smile on God's face. You see, this, this, this ability to think can either lift us up or drag us down. And tonight we're realigning our thoughts with the chief cornerstone, no longer going to believe the biases that the greatest is the greatest. As we continue to read in Luke chapter 9, verse 49, we see another bias that can hinder us. It's the misconception that anyone who doesn't have full truth is our enemy. The problem with that bias, if exercised, is that it would exclude many of us as being the enemy. Those of us who were raised with a different doctrine. You see, I wasn't born into this truth. I, I grew up in a place that didn't know who Jesus was. Or that baptism is for the remission of sins. Or, or that Jesus is God and there is no other. I, these, these weren't pieces of information that were given to me. We read this bias in Luke chapter 9, verse 49. And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him because he followeth not with us. He doesn't go to our church. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. You see, we don't need to draw lines or create debates with other doctrines. That's not our mission, that's not our calling. We're not looking to take away anything from anyone else's experiences. We're, we're looking to add more to what they have. See, for a true believer, we need to have a love for the sinner and the saint, for the Baptist and the Methodist, not trying to tear somebody down in order to, to win them to God. Yeah. But, but when God presents an opportunity, we need to add to their understanding with love, with respect. Yeah, I, I've... I've I, some, someone sent me some, uh, some links to a video and I, I honestly didn't even watch it. I clicked on it for 30 seconds and it was a debate. It was the, you know, here's how we argue with Trinitarians. No, no, we don't enter into the, this, this world looking for an argument. Right. We're looking for someone we can extend love to, that we can um, befriend, that we can get to know, that we can find a way to meet a need, and then when the opportunity presents itself, we plant a seed of truth. But just like disciples, we as humans, we want to be associated with the winning team or denomination. I mean, whatever jersey you want to wear. The Bible says that our desire to, to be on the winning team should not require someone else to lose in the process. If they're not against us, they're for us. Now, I'm not saying we should compromise our doctrine or water down or um, fellowship the differences. But if God has put somebody in your path and he's opened a door for relationship, there's a purpose for that relationship, that connection. You see, looking back, I wasn't raised in this truth, and I, but I thank God for the foundation that was laid in that evangelical church for the experiences I had in the spirit that I didn't even understand were the spirit until later when God opened me up to this truth and I looked back and I said, oh, that's what happened back then. Yeah, this, this body, this, this group of believers were associated with the United Pentecostal Church International. And um, I want you to know that the UPCI is, UPCI is not the only organization with truth. This is not a, an exclusive club that we're a part of. And while I appreciate the benefits of camps and our collective ability to fund missions and the leadership that God has put in place to, to lead us in that, into that mission, don't put your trust in a brand name or of us versus them. Connect with God and read his Bible for yourself. Some of these biases, these deep-seated thought patterns have been around since mankind's fall into sin. It, it, it happened from the very beginning. It didn't even need to wait for media in order to create some new ones. And it's, it's not new for mankind to be predispositioned or incorrectly making assumptions about people based on ethnicity, gender, social status. As we continue to read here in Luke chapter 9, we see how these biases can be applied both in both directions to us and from us. If you turn to Luke chapter 9, verse 52, here the disciples, they're, they're trying to reserve a room 
for Jesus in a Samaritan village on their way to Jerusalem. But the Samaritans wouldn't allow Jesus and his disciples to lodge it. They put out the sign, no Jews here. Because Jesus and his disciples had the wrong skin color. They spoke the wrong language. They ate a different kind of food than the Samaritans. And so now Jesus and his disciples, they're, they're being discriminated against. And James and John are so outraged, they ask Jesus for permission to call down fire on these bigoted Samaritans. Let's read Luke chapter 9, verse 54. And when his disciples, these men of God, when these men of God, James and John, saw this, this discrimination against themselves, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? But he turned, this is Jesus, and rebuked them and said, ye know not what manner of spirit you are. That spirit that wants to fight fire with fire, that's not God. That spirit that wants to enter into a debate so I can convince you and condemn you that your, your understanding is wrong is, is not God's spirit. Verse 56 gives us the, the correct approach. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And so what did they do? They went to another village. Let it fall off their shoulder. So whichever direction the discrimination is coming, whether it's coming at us or coming from us, God's, God forbid. The struggle between these cultures was real. The Jews had nothing to do with the Samaritans. They wouldn't talk with them. They wouldn't trade with them. They wouldn't be seen with them. And when they wanted to come stay at one of their hotels, the Samaritans said no. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun, and this world we live in is ever becoming more divided. But let me tell you, if an individual walks through those doors, it is not by coincidence that they're here. It doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter what they smell like. It doesn't matter how they dress the color of their hair, none of these things dictate whether they should be here or not because they walked through that door, they should be here. I remember many years ago, there was a man um, learned afterwards that he was living out of his car. And uh, he came in clearly looking for a handout, so much so that he, he kind of put on a little bit of a show, like, look at me, woe is me. He came all the way right up to the front, and um, there wasn't a lot of room on the front pew, but he kind of looked at me like, Oh, you, okay. So I moved over. We all moved over. I said, sit right next to me. You know, the service has already started at that point. And as things unfolded, right, we had an altar call, and I got a chance to talk to him for a minute. And he said, I thought it was kind of strange that, that you let me sit here. Um, I smell really bad. How can you stand it? And honest to God, I couldn't smell anything. And so look at him. I believe what he was telling me. But when we, when we make space for anybody, whether they smell good or bad. Now, I wish I could tell you the story where he was baptized and filled the Spirit, but I don't know what role I play in the story that God is trying to write in his life. But I know that if a, there was a man living out of his car that needed some help, and he f somehow found his way into this parking lot and somehow walked through those doors, then it's my obligation to give him a chance to receive this truth, to, to welcome him with, with love and appreciation and respect, not because of what he looks like or, or who he is or where he comes from, but because God has brought him into my vicinity. He's crossed paths with me. If they have a heartbeat, if they're still alive, if there's breath in their lungs, I don't care what reasons they came for. God can take their wrong reasons and do something with them. You know, the Bible says that if you don't have the love of God in you, then you are none of his. And so to, we need to ask God to, to remove anything that would prevent his love from extending to those that are around us that might get in the way of what God is wanting to do in our midst. You know, it's interesting, just a, a few verses away in Luke chapter 10, Jesus uses the parable of the Good Samaritan to explain what good looks like. The same Samaritans that said, hey, no Jews here. He's, he's trying to tell us that it doesn't matter the color of your skin, your ethnicity, your background. Good isn't based on those things. My Bible says that none is good except God and that all men have sinned. 
And so as we move on in Luke chapter 9, we see Jesus now recruiting people to follow him. In Luke 9 and 57, one man raises his hand and says, I'll follow you, Jesus. And Jesus says, just so you know, following me comes with a price, sometimes uncertainty, uh, some discomfort. In Luke 9 and 59, Jesus asks a different man to follow him, and the man says, yes, I'll follow you, but, but I have to first bury my father. And Jesus replies, let the dead bury the dead. God is standing here in front of you himself saying, I want you, and you're saying you have to go do something? <laughs> you know, our busy lives sometimes, they just kind of dictate how we're going to operate, the things that we do and take priority at times over the things of God. Another man in the last few verses of Luke chapter 9, verses 61 to 62, he volunteers to follow Jesus, but it comes with some conditions. God, I'll follow you, but I first have to be able to... He says, I'll follow you, Jesus, but I first need to say goodbye to my family. Seems like a reasonable request. But Jesus replies, there's only a go-forward path with me. Once you pick up this cross, there's no turning back. There, there, in other words, you just can't kind of follow me. The Bible says that God would have other, rather have us warm or cold versus lukewarm. In that case, he'll spit us out. Now as we, we progress from Luke chapter 9, starting in Luke chapter 10, verse 1. Luke chapter 10 and 1 says, After these things the Lord appointed other 70 also, not the 12, and he sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. The principle here is that leads to the hour that Jesus rejoiced in was that it was no longer just the 12 disciples. Now it was 70. You see, God rejoices when the church doesn't rely on the ministry or a small group of people to do the work building the kingdom of God. But when the church body themselves perceive themselves more accurately, when they see themselves, every one of them as ministers and high priests, everyone having equal access to the power and the authority, that's, that's what puts a smile on God's face. Jesus rejoiced when a group of people suddenly realized who they were and their perception had changed from nobodies to somebodies. You see, God hasn't put any limits on anyone within his kingdom except for their willingness to become obedient to his word. But we, in our biases and our preconceptions, we can put limits on ourselves. Sometimes we do that knowingly and sometimes we do that unknowingly. Then as Jesus prepares them for the mission, he, he's called us all to fulfill. He gives this group a set of instructions. It, it was the same set of instructions he had given to the 12. Reading now from Luke chapter 10, verse 2. Therefore he said unto them, The harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. And here's the instructions. We've been given the commission, that's all of us. But he, he wants to guide us in this journey. In verse 3, go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. In other words, you're not going to win them with a debate. Be gentle like lambs. Verse 4, he gives us another instruction. Carry neither purse nor script nor shoes nor salute no man by the way. In other words, don't over plan what's going to happen. Because what you think should happen will limit what God wants to happen. If we have to wait for the conditions to be right, to line up with what we think the conditions should be, we will be waiting for a long time. But if we'll take that step of faith that says, God, I, I believe you're leading me here, and when I take that step, you're going to meet me there, that puts a smile on God's face. Luke chapter 10, verse 5 gives us another instruction. It says, And into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn again turn to you again. In other words, don't try to make things happen. Let things unfold. Let them unfold with the people you cross paths with, whether it's at work or in the store. And when that door opens up to connect or talk with someone, that person, it will happen naturally. And if it doesn't, don't try to force it. If you knock on the door and they answer, well, now you have an opportunity to conversate. If you knock on the door and they don't answer, that's not on you. 
Verse 7 goes on to explain when the door opens what we should do next. In that same house, in that same relationship, eating and drinking and such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire, go not from house to house and into whatsoever city you enter, and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. When that door opens up, when there's a, a point of contact made, when two paths cross, we need to build a relationship there. We need to be friendly, to break bread, to, to have fellowship. And as those doors present themselves, we need to follow through with that relationship, to foster a friendship. I love the analogy I heard from a, a minister, and it, it is, there was such wisdom in it. And I've shared it with some of you. I may have even spoke it from this pulpit. But he said, when, you, when you're, you're witnessing or, or um, building friendships, making relationships, um, with the hopes that, that you can bring somebody into the kingdom. He said, you need, to, you need to approach it like checkers. You make a move, and then they make a move. And then you make a move. And then they make a move. But if we keep trying to make all the moves, we can become very frustrated. And so if we go to a house, if we go to a person, we knock on the door and they say, hey, let's, you know what? You seem like a friendly person. Let's hang out. How do, what, what are we going to do? You should follow that. Build a relationship. Let it unfold naturally, not trying to force it right. We, we sometimes get caught up in trying to think, well, if I say the right things, if I, if I pray the right prayer before we go into Hardy's, the person at the counter might, right? No, the, 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 it's not about what you can contrive in your mind. It's about being willing and ready so that when the door presents itself, if it opens, you can walk through it. God is going to put people in our paths. It says the, the footsteps of the righteous are ordered. And, and that doesn't just mean when God gives you a vision and says you need to go to Walmart right now and talk to the person in aisle 10. <laughs> if that happens, you should do that. But in most cases, he's just going to let you go for the thing that you needed at Walmart. And when you're in aisle 10, right, that's the way it happens. And here we are trying to, to, to figure it out, thinking... You know, I need to do something. No, God's just saying, when you go into a city and into a house, if they, if they welcome you in, then you should walk in the, and have fellowship. And whatever they put in front of you, don't, don't stick your nose up at it. Right? Foster a relationship, knowing that you're trying to, to win somebody into the kingdom of God. And here's, here's where the kingdom of God comes in. So it's interesting to note that we haven't even gotten to preaching to them or teaching them, perhaps, in Luke chapter 10, verse 9, he says, now that you have this relationship, now that you've broken bread, now that they've, they've offered you food and there's some common ground, verse 9, and heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. The relationship needs to precede the gospel. If we go beat everyone over the head with the gospel, we'll have no friends, <laughs> no relationships. And, but through the relationship, through showing of kindness, through breaking of bread, that's when the real need comes to the surface. You know, there's, there's the, the perceived needs. I need a ride. I need a few dollars. I need help in this area. Oh, I happen to be able to help you. And then through that help of the perceived need, the real need comes to the surface. That's salvation. They're never going to come to you and say, I'm looking for salvation. Can you help me? No, no. <laughs> I'm broken down by the side of the road. I, 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 in fact, I just experienced this, and it was, it was, I wish I could tell you the end of the story, but it's not my story to tell, except that as I was uh, going up to men's camp, I was driving, and as I was driving um, towards Shano, there was a, I was on a side road, and there was a truck pulled over, and I could see that he was, he had a flat tire, and he had his spare down, and um, it was a, it was not a small truck, and he had one of those little bottle jacks. That's what, the, that's what came with it. I'm not sure that that jack could ever lift that up on any surface, let alone that now he's on the side of a gravel road, kind of tilted off to the side. And I have learned this lesson, and so I carry a full-size floor jack in the back of my, uh, behind my passenger seat. So I did a UE, turned back, um, said, do you, do you need some help? I got a full-size floor jack. And he's like, absolutely right. He, he, was, he wasn't going to get out of there without something more than what he had. Um, and so we, we really quickly got it jacked up, and as, we're, as he's taking the tire off and switching them out, he's like, I feel like you were sent here for a purpose. <laughs> I 
I was like, I feel like I was sent here for a purpose too. And told him just a little bit about where we were going and what was happening. And um, that was it. You know, I don't know what seed was planted and where, what will grow there. But I know that I was on a road and a person had a need and I had the ability to fulfill their need. And that's how God works. You know, we can beat ourselves up and, and, and really start to perceive ourselves wrong when we start to put this, this weight of this responsibility that we have to figure out how to get them saved. When God is saying, no, no, just stay connected with me. Understand the authority you have in me. Understand who you are in me. And I will line up the circumstances in which the miraculous will happen. As the musicians come tonight in Luke chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus gives us many words of warning about this, this mission he's called us to embark upon. He's warning us um, not to take it too personally for those that don't receive this truth. Sometimes, like I said before, we, we take on this burden that um, we want them to be saved, but they don't want to be saved or receive information. And it doesn't matter how much you want it for them, they have to want it for them. And that's where that relationship comes in, because if you, if you have a connection that's more than just, you, you, you're going to hell, let me help you, that's your opportunity to be like, okay, well, maybe not today, but next time we get together for coffee, let me tell you what happened. There was a miracle at church, right? That's where the relationship goes past just debates over what the, the scriptures say. And so this portion of scripture warns us um, sometimes not to take on burdens that we weren't meant to carry, that we shouldn't put in ourselves that we have to figure out how to convince that person or persuade that person to choose God as if we ourselves are God, that we can save them. All we can do is be obedient to the word of God, to, to walk in the spirit, to be ready to answer a door that presents itself and if open, to walk through it. And when the or door doesn't open or when it gets shut in our face, to not let it um, take our own joy away. See, we're just a conduit for God's love and his word to, to touch somebody else. Um, and, and when we knock on the doors of their heart, if they'll open, that truth will walk in. Not because we, we figured out the right way to present it, but just because we were truth in, 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 their, in their presence. So tonight we finish with our opening text. This is all the things that, that preceded up to the question, that, to answer the question, what makes Jesus rejoice? What puts a smile on his face? And so reading again our opening text in Luke chapter 10, verse 17, in the 70, not the twelve, returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. We, we understand who we are in you, God. Jesus replies, that's great, you understand, but don't, don't rejoice that the spirits are subject unto you, but rejoice rather that your names are written in heaven. It was in that hour that Jesus rejoiced in his spirit. Rejoiced because there was a group of people that stepped out of their misconceptions about who they were realizing their value to the kingdom and consequently stepping into their role, rightly perceiving themselves as children of the king, able to exercise authority in his name. You know, sometimes um, these perceptions, well, they come from all sorts of places and they, they, there's many of them. We, we, we lightly touched on them. But there's one perception in particular, I, I think, holds us back probably more than all the others. I was watching a video, an interview video of this uh, Hasidic Jew. Hasidic Jews are the, the Jews that, that truly are trying their best to follow the Old Testament law. And even within the Hasidic Jews, there's a whole variety of sects that go from, um, I'll say, you know, li more liberal to, to very, very strict. If you thought it was difficult to live for God, <laughs> there's a much longer list that you could sign up for. God's not asking you to do that, but these Hasidic Jews, they, 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 do, they have a whole lot 
um, that they do in order to show their love for God. And, and there's something in that I, I actually re- truly respect. They, they've, they, they've disciplined their lives in ways that, well. But what caught my attention in this interview wasn't all the things that they do, although that was interesting. Um, what, what was compelling to me was their perception of themselves and God. It was very different than uh, the non-Jew, I'll just say. Me, you and I, the rest of us. See, see as this, this Hasidic Jew was explaining repentance to the person that was interviewing him, he was saying, like, we're, we're human, we make mistakes, we don't always do it right, and we know that we can just ask God to forgive us and that he forgives us and that God is for us, we're his chosen people. See, they perceived themselves as having God for them, that they were chosen, that it wasn't God with a, a big club waiting to, to clock them in the head and get them out of the way. No, no. He, he's already made a way for us to succeed. He's got our back. If God be for us, who can be against us? They had a perception that was very different. <laughs> we're looking at all the things that will exclude us, and they're saying, no, no, God is for us. There's, this thing works. It was a different mindset. If we could start to adopt that mindset that, that truly perceives God has forgiven me, God knows I'm not perfect, and as I'm reaching forward in my best ability to conform to the word of God, God is for me. He loves me. His love is not conditional. And yes, his blessings and promises are conditional in our obedience, but his love doesn't waver. It doesn't change. If God be for us, who can be against us? If we can perceive our position in God, God is going to give us new experiences. And through those experiences, it will compel us to step out in ways that we didn't step out before, to see the miraculous. And as we see the miraculous, it'll cause us to want to step out more. The author and finisher of our faith is still writing our stories. But don't settle for everything you've experienced up to this point as if that's all. Would you stand with me tonight? One last thought. I, I remember last summer, some of our youth are here. We, we went to our own camp, Camp Duan. It was a great time. It was a lot of effort, but well worth the investment. And during that time, we, we were on a theme of, you know, listening for the voice of God. And that, that first, um, I'll say, exercise we did, the, the, the youth, we all went off into the woods individually. And their instructions were to, to go into this place, to leave their cell phones behind, to, to remove some of the distractions, and to ask God, God, what do you think about me? And it was such a blessing and, and so, so encouraging to hear some of their testimonies as, as tears streamed down their face and my face as God answered their question. And the perception God had of them was very different than the perception they had of themselves. And so tonight, I would encourage you to do the same to ask God, what do you think of me, God? Who am I in you, God? And what misperceptions have I placed on myself that you want to remove so that I can step into the role that you've called me to step into? Because God is for me. He loves me. He has a way for me to become what he wants me to become. And no matter where I'm at in the process, as long as I'm moving forward, I am in his perfect will, in his perfect place, in his perfect time. God, change our perception of the world that's all around us. The altar's open tonight. Would you come?